Okay. Um, this is uh, plenary session number four. My name is Gary Wu from the University of Pennsylvania, and this uh, the topic for this session is microbiota derived molecules. Our first speaker uh, is Pierre Marie Ladeau, and um, he's from the Institut Pasteur. He's a member of the European Academy of Science. He's uh, head of the Laboratory of Perception and Memory at the Pasteur Institute, and he investigates how the gastrointestinal system its uh, resident microbes and the brain communicate with the uh, gut-brain axis. So he'll be speaking about bacterial sensing, the uh, neuronal nod to um, and how it regulates appetite and body temperature. All right, thank you very much. Um, first of all, I, I'd like to thank the uh, organizers for uh, having me here on board. And I'd like to take this opportunity uh, to talk about uh, this uh, brain-gut axis, and, and you're going to have some uh, new insights about uh, this communication. Um, before I forgot, I'd like to thank the people who have been uh, collecting the data I'm going to present you, um, and uh, you, you will see how much uh, the brain should be seen as an organ integrating both external cues as well as uh, internal uh, signals. Um, in other words, since uh, maybe the audience is not familiar with the brain, I'd just like to remind you that uh, the brain takes into account four dimensions. The first one is time, obviously. Brain, like many other organs, change over time. But the brain also receive signal from uh, the external uh, environments, what I call here exposome to extend the initial uh, definition of these words to what I will say today, um, any variations of external cues. But also the brain take into account signals coming from the internal states. And you will see, for instance, how much our behavior might change just according to a change of the internal uh, signals whenever the uh, exposomes is, is not changing. And finally, the fourth dimension is uh, scale. Since all this um, interaction between internal and exposomes will occur at very different levels from molecules to behavior as I'm going to show you. Of course, um, by, by saying the brain is in between, a border between external um, events and internal signals, this is reminiscent to uh, the notion of Claude Bernard and this requirement of uh, internal states. Uh, these questions that was also uh, brought by uh, Walter Cannon on this question of homeostasis. What are you going to see from my presentation that the brain having some interaction between different systems. Here, immune systems, we will talk about endocrinology as well and, and nervous systems. We'll see how the behavior could be adapted uh, regarding this uh, requirement of internal stability. So let's go first into this dimension brain react to the external cues. That's obvious. And the reason why this brain is able to react because they are sensory systems. And, and then by processing this sensory information, brain will trigger uh, behavioral actions. But I'm going to show you now if we are going to play with internal signals like, for instance, stress hormones, we're going to play with cortisols, we might see how much actions are going to change. For that, this is a, a, an example of variability of the external words. Uh, you know, we put mice in different uh, situations. It's like us being a researcher, trying to get fundings and, 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 and publish papers. It's, it's, it's a nightmare, I know. And we do the same thing with the mice. We put them in different environments, and then we look their behavior. So you see from these panels, we have behavioral tasks to uh, assess anxiety levels. We have a behavior task 
challenging both anxiety and depression, and we have tasks only uh, assessing uh, depression. So what I'm going to show you now, let's see what's going on with the normal animals and animals that have been treated with corticosteroids. And as you can see here on this graph, all the, 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 the black dots here are uh, shifted toward the, 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 the right, meaning that for animals treated by, uh, with cortisol, we put uh, 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 cortisol into the drinking water and, and look what's going on to the behavior of the animals. As you can see, we turn animals in health, from healthy to depressive states. And, and discussing with my uh, friends and, and neighbor, uh, Gérard Rebel, when I'm talking about depression of mice, for him, he's an immunologist, he was talking about immunodepression. So then we decided to look together whether by treating animals with cortisols, whether we do uh, some changes in the immune systems as well as we change the brain of the animals. So we look at the, uh, 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 the, the compositions of the gut uh, microbiota. And when I said we, I mean uh, Eleni Siopi on the left and Grégoire Chevalier on the right. I've been looking at carefully uh, the changes of the uh, gut uh, bacteria compositions in, in, the, in, the, in the situation where we have control and then you have uh, uh, cortisol treated animals. And as you can see here, um, there is clearly uh, some species that were increased in density, in, uh, in, in quantity uh, after corticosteroid treatments while others were reduced. So then we wonder whether if we take this microbiota into a stress animal and we transplant it to the healthy animals, could we turn a healthy animals into a depressed animals? Not anymore by using cortisol, but just by this um, fecal transplantations. In other words, this is a, the, the, the topics we were trying to cover. <clears throat> we turn animals into uh, healthy, into, into stress, and then we, do, we did this microbiota transplantations and look whether we could find the hallmark of depressions, meaning uh, change in the adult neurogenesis, change in the metabolomics, and, and, and you will see metagenomics as well as behavioral. So first of all, again, uh, orange columns here show you uh, how we can turn healthy animal into depressed animal. This uh, battery of, uh, of tests just to show you that animals that have been treated uh, either by cortisol or another paradigm called uh, unchronic, uh, unpredicted chronic mice stress, sorry. Uh, you, you can see that the animals are more um, immobile, right? So now let's do this fecal transplantation into healthy animals and we find the all marks. And this was obviously done totally uh, blind and we turn healthy animals into depressed animals. Uh, of course, we wanted to see whether we could have impact, as I told you, on this multi-scale analysis. Not only the behavior is changes, but whatever the brain of those animals. So we look at um, adult neurogenesis in the hippocampus, which is a, a nice proxy of, uh, of, uh, of, of depressions and, uh, and, and with, uh, less reduction, with more reduction of adult neurogenesis, more severe would be the um, phenotype of depression. So as you can see on the orange uh, column here, you have a reduction of neurogenesis that was well known after either this uh, uh, UCMS or cortisol treatments. We knew it already, but what was new in this story was to find that just by doing this transplantation of the microbiota from stress animals, uh, we could also reduce the uh, a, a quantity of newborn neurons um, born into the, uh, into the brain. So, of course, um, there was something magic here. We wanted to go and nail down to look at the molecular level. What's going on when we are doing this transplantation? So we did, we took blood and we just put the serum onto a Petri dish in order to see whether just if we got some serum from uh, uh, um, transplanted animals, 
with a stress microbiota, we could see again this phenotype, reduction of neurogenesis, and this is what B, uh, panel B and C are showing. We indeed find that just by taking, not anymore so this transplantation of microbiota, but by taking the serum, we could reduce the adult neurogenesis. So we went into a, uh, a metabolic um, analysis of the sera, and we found two major compounds that were changes in the serum of transplanted mice uh, with stress uh, uh, microbiota, and the yellow ones are lipids, the blue ones are amino acids. And we found that both of these compounds were reduced after the uh, fecal transplantation. For instance, when we look for amino acids, we find that this 5-hydroxytryptophan uh, was reduced by this uh, fecal transplantation. And this story uh, published was, in fact, uh, um, a study on why some animals, depressed animals, turn to be resistant to fluoxetin. We found that if we add 5-hydroxytryptophan in the food of the animals, we could restore uh, uh, the uh, fluoxetine sensitivity for stress animals. So by doing these transplantations, not only we reduce the level of amino acids, in, and in particular the 5-hydroxytryptophan, uh, but also as you, you can see on the blue um, columns here, we have a reduction of uh, uh, lipid metabolites. And to really make sure the story, so we did another paper uh, uh, to understand that uh, uh, with this uh, microbiota dysbiosis, uh, we have a, a reductions of endogenous cannabinoids, and by just compl complementation in the food of uh, short-chain fatty acids or uh, some probiotics, we could restore, we could have an antidepressant effect of this um, bacteria of this uh, uh, dysbiosis, sorry. So all in all, so far what I show you um, is that the brain can be challenged to uh, adversity. Uh, we have this uh, HPA axis where we see uh, changes into the uh, microbiota. What I'd like to show you now is that you have also another way to think about uh, this brain, brain gut axis uh, working by looking directly now uh, on this bacteria that can send signals to the brain. And this um, study was done working with two colleagues, uh, again, Gerard, uh, immunologist, and Ivo Boneka, uh, a microbiologist, in which we have been looking carefully on what kind of signals the gut microbiota uh, could send to the brain. And we've been looking for muropeptides found in the blood, and, and I'm going to show you now uh, where are they going to work on. So muropeptides uh, are elements for uh, gram-positive quite uh, easy to access, and for uh, gram-negative bacteria, they are in between uh, uh, two membranes. Um, muropeptides have their own receptors, uh, not two. Uh, luckily, not two receptors can have a, a ligand, which is a synthetic uh, ligand. We will see later on how much it's important. And uh, NOT2 was well known to be expressed in immune cells. And, uh, and it was also well known that NOT2 variant has been associated with uh, chronic inflammations. So having shown that um, we have neuropeptides, um, we have NOT2 um, in the body, we wanted to see whether um, we could have NOT2 expression into the brain. Knowing that NOT2 is expressed in um, immune cells, our first target was to look at NOT2 in immune cells of the brain, the so-called microglia, uh, here stained by EBI1. EBI1 was indeed showing that NOT2 was expressed in the brain, and we were not discovering anything new. While uh, uh, when we look, outside of these uh, microglia cells, for us, this turned to be a surprise. We could find not to expression in many neurons in different brain regions. Why these receptors made to 
detect uh, bacteria signals are expressed in, in some part of the brain, not everywhere. Uh, for instance, uh, in the middle panels, you have the striatum. This is fascinating. We are not going to work. I launch here an idea for those who want to work on that. I think, you know, striatum, reward systems, reward systems, food, it's easy. Whether now some food acting on not two could trigger some addictions, it's, it's uh, open questions. And again, I'm not going to work on that. But so we have been looking carefully on one precise region, the uh, hypothalamic uh, region. And before, uh, sorry, before changing the gear, showing in the brain expression that there is a not to doesn't mean you will have a functional meaning of that. Why that? Because we know that uh, there are many receptors m working with different agonists. So uh, showing the receptors is present is not uh, a proof, actually, uh, through this concept of uh, exaptation. This function could be used for something else. So the brain could have its own uh, endogenous agonists of NOT2. So we went first to look whether NOT2, oh, sorry, the neuropeptide could go from the gut to the brain through the blood. And as you can see here, you have, uh, uh, so we, we label um, uh, neuropeptides uh, through GAVAGE and look at different time points whether we could find neuropeptides labeled into the blood. As you can see, indeed, we, we observed. And interestingly, we observed as well uh, in the brain the neuropeptide. So that's turned to be now interesting. We have the receptors and we have the agonist entering into the brain. From uh, Claude Bernard inspirations, when you want to know one function, you remove it. So we did transgenic animals, remove not to in the whole brain and see what's going on. As you can see here, as the animals are going to age, when they turn to be around six, um, six months age, animals start to gain weight when you, we remove not to. Only females, not males. Again, an open question. I have no idea why. So because we have seen um, now expression of NOT2 in the brain, we have seen that there is a functional meaning. When you remove NOT2, animals start to eat more, and they have a, a loss of body temperature. I didn't spoke about that yet. Uh, so we went into details on whether if we had this agonist of NOT2 MDP, the synthetic an, uh, agonist, uh, bring it to the brain, what kind of neurons will be turned on or turned off? And we did this without any um, hypothesis. So this was a really uh, an, 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 uh, um, thorough uh, analysis of the brain, looking at CFOS, meaning neuronal activity, by uh, in, inducing uh, NOT2 activation through MDP injections. And we did a lot of maps into the brain. And one of them, um, which is shown on the right corner, green panels here in the middles, you have uh, the hypothalamus that is uh, activated in green, meaning we have a significant uh, reduction when we turn on uh, NOT2 receptors. So then we decided to be more uh, precise and do genetic precisely to this area of the brain, to the hypothalamus, and we remove NOT2 only in this area. How come, you know, this way of using not uh, flux animals, so we use flux animals for NOT2, and we use viruses to remove, by introducing viruses only in the hypothalamus, we remove NOT2 only in this brain area, and look what's going on. Well, again, again, after removing NOT2 only in the hypothalamus, over time, it takes about um, six weeks, we start to see animals without NOT2 in the hypothalamus eating more and more. Again, you see uh, the, uh, not only the food consumption is increased for these uh, precise knockout animals, but as well, uh, the temperature control is, is lost. We decided that, okay, now we have a tool to remove NOT2 in a precise area. 
whether NOT2 is, 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 is activated by bacteria, this is not shown in this experiment. So we decided to combine antibiotic treatments and removing NOT2. In other words, in this experiment that you can see on the left panel over there, with uh, NOT2 removed and see an increase of body weight over time, should we put first animals, use germ-free animals, remove NOT2, see what's going on? This is shown on the left panels. When you remove NOT2 in germ-free animals, you don't see any change in the body weight. But as soon as you remove antibiotic treatments, then animals gain weight for those who have been deleted for NOT2, sorry. I hope I'm clear enough, otherwise <coughs> uh, I will keep time to uh, open debates. So far, I tried to demonstrate how much NOT2 expression only in the hypothalamus is able to uh, control uh, food consumptions. So we decided to look the activity of this nucleus in the hypothalamus and, and uh, when I said we, I mean uh, Gabriel uh, Le Pouzet, who has been working on living animals. Days after days, we implant uh, 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 fibers, and as you can see, we find in this brain area, the hypothalamus, the uh, arcuate nucleus, when we give food to animals, this brain region is silent, like a satiety factors make these animals not, in, doesn't want to eat anymore. When we inject MDP, control first, it's a control, there is no activation of NOT2, we don't see any change in the neuronal activity of this nucleus. But now, if we use MDP, we find a kind of an exercise. It's, it's the, the neuronal activity is over when we turn uh, uh, MDP into the blood of these animals. So we had an idea about how now uh, MDP or muropeptide in general in the blood goes into the brain, inhibit those hypothalamic neurons. How come? Then we went into even more details. We're not rec recording like it is here a population of neurons. We are going to record only one neurons doing slice physiology, we take brain, we cut slices, and we patch neuron after neurons. And now we are going to introduce MDP into the recording electrodes and look over time if this MDP is really indeed able to inhibit neurons. Guess what? The pink traces shows clearly that MDP in the pipette, uh, the recording pipette introduced into the nucleus into, into the cytosol, sorry, where you have NOT2, once you turn on NOT2, you inhibit electrical activity of hypothalamic neurons. We took other neurons and they were not sensitive. So we have a very, very specific effect here of NOT2 inhibiting neuronal activity of hypothalamic neurons involved in food consumption. This is a summary so far. I show you that once animals are eating, you have an increase, you have a proliferation of the gut microbiota, you have muropeptide that will go through uh, the, the blood flow to uh, uh, activate brain nuclei. We focus only on one region, the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is going to be inhibited. In, uh, hypothalamic activity is going to be inhibited by uh, these uh, peptides, these uh, muropeptides, and as a result, animals uh, give up uh, uh, eating. And when you remove NOT2, there is no satiety factors anymore. Uh, after all, this should not be surprising uh, because a few years ago, we already showed that uh, uh, the immune cells of the brain, the microglia, are completely changes when uh, we were treated uh, pregnant uh, females uh, with different way to challenge their uh, uh, gut microbiota. So uh, this is another, another way of seeing uh, this interaction between gut um, microbiota and, and brain functions. I showed you before on neuronal activity, but this work already show us uh, how much immune cells uh, of the brain, microglia, are also impacted by uh, 
uh, gut microbiota. All right, so let's move on now. Uh, first of all, I show you uh, how much stress hormone change the microbiota, and then you, we, we have seen a lot of uh, metabolites from the, the gut microbiota going into the brain and involved in depressions, either by reduction of amino acids or reduction of lipid metabolites. We have seen now there are direct actions of fragments of uh, bacteria to the brain. Let's put a, lot, a little bit more complexity now where I will show you the link between gut and brain through a uh, vagus nerve. Um, this is um, a collaboration we, we had with uh, Ari Sokol, well known in this uh, um, uh, associations or um, uh, field here. Uh, and this was, sorry, um, sorry. I, and this was, um, the purpose of this work was to show how much uh, gut microbiota changes could also uh, impact the uh, brain aging. So we did uh, human uh, transfer or we did uh, mice to mice transfer, gut microbiota transfer into uh, a young or uh, uh, aged uh, mice and we look over time how much this will impact their behavior. Uh, and this work was done by one uh, of, of the postdoc in the lab, Damien Ray, where um, he was showing that uh, if you have a young recipient mice receiving either uh, 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 microbiota from uh, old or young uh, mice, we wait a few days, few weeks, some time, and challenge their memory. The blue column here on the B panel show you that the memory was intact for a an young animal receiving young microbiota. You see the, uh, the score of memory is the same as a young uh, 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 recipient, uh, don uh, donor mass, okay? But for the red, as you can see, there is no more memory. So we, in another way, we have been erasing memory by, by transferring old uh, microbiota into a young uh, um, mice. What about human beings? Oh, sorry, so I'm skipping this. What about human beings? We did the same thing for here, uh, four uh, uh, persons. So we, we had, uh, again, a young recipient mice in which we are going to transfer um, human microbiota. Uh, and we are going to make, uh, to have humanized mice. So some of the mice will receive young uh, uh, microbiota, young meaning less than 35 years old, and old or senior um, will mean here more than 65 um, years old. And so we have uh, uh, two uh, groups of, uh, of human, humanized mice, uh, young in young and old in young. And again, you can see that for the mice, the young mice receiving the young microbiota, we don't impair uh, the uh, score memory here, while for the uh, mice receiving the old uh, microbiota, as you can see, memory was gone. And so we went into more details on how much by changing the gut microbiota, this could impact the brain. Of course, one of the main relay, uh, the nodose ganglia, and then the brainstem with the nucleus tractus solitari. We look for uh, neuronal activity in this place, and what we found that the basal states, the basal degree of activity of the brainstem was in fact, as you can see for the red column here, on the right, panel B, you have a reduction. So by transferring all microbiota into a young mice, you see the uh, neuronal activity of the brainstem is reduced. This is for the spontaneous level. And you might know that uh, the neuronal activity of the NTS is increased during food consumption, for instance. So when we went into also challenging the brainstem activity by uh, leaving animals uh, getting some food, and as you can see here, when you have this uh, microbiota transfer from young to young, 
the uh, uh, brainstem is, uh, this is shown in panel C on the right uh, uh, side, you have clearly an ev evoked responses of the brainstem, but you don't see this in the brainstem of animal transplanted by, um, with uh, old uh, microbiota. So not only the basal level is reduced, but the evoked responses are gone uh, with this uh, transplantation. Uh, this is a bit complicated, I'm skipping that, and I just like to, uh, how am I doing with time? I'm okay, ah, so you are lucky, then we go into more. <laughs> but don't worry, it's going to be simple. <coughs> so far, I, I, I show you, I this will take one minute to understand. So far, I show you, it seems to be a miracle. You know, you change the microbiota, whatever you do, put mustard or ketchup, and, and then the brain is on, off, on, off. I mean, it's, we are missing here, uh, you know, a way to interact directly in the systems in order to be not only correlative, but looking at causal link. And how can we do that? Well, you have this ascending pathway that goes to the nodes for the, for, for the vagus nerves, and then the, the brainstem. So we decided to look for the mice receiving age into uh, age microbiota into young uh, mice, we are going to see now if we can compensate this lack of activity, as I showed you before, by chemogenetics. We're going to activate the vagus nerve very simply in a very precise and specific manner. We're going to inject viruses you, you know why I'm working at Pasteur. We, we have viruses in everywhere. So we use viruses here in the, in, in the nodos ganglia in order to express in specific neurons uh, receptors that we have an agonist to activate it. So it's called here uh, HM3D uh, for muscarinic human and, and so on and so forth. And we can use CNO, which is the agonist of this uh, receptor. So if you follow me, it's easy. Now we have a way to turn on the nodos activity by uh, bringing CNO into the blood. And by doing that, so if you now just concentrate on panel G, uh, on, the, on the columns on the right part here, so you have the activity of the brain when we transfer um, the mi old, mo old microbiota into young, you have a reduction of the brain activity. On the panel E, you see that memory is gone. Animal don't remember anymore. But now, if we are at the same time transferring old microbiota and activated the ascending pathway of uh, vagus nerves, animals can Remember, you, this is a yellow column, panel F here. You see how much we have been now able to have a recall of memory. We, we prevent uh, this uh, vagus, this uh, ascending signaling to be blocked by activating the nodos. And indeed, we had this brain activity, panel G, and panel F, we have a memory recall perfectly. All right, uh, this is just to give you a flavor uh, on work going on now, um, because I didn't want to stick to only uh, published papers. Um, but uh, since we have developed now a, a good expertise in the lab in cutting <laughs> vagus nerves or challenging uh, with other tool viruses to increase, decrease, record uh, vagus nerve activity, we are going back to depressions in order to look how much the vagus nerve is also important for uh, transmitting uh, gut dysbiosis uh, into the brain and trigger depression. And part of uh, this depression is also mediated by the vagus nerve uh, uh, activity as we have been able to demonstrate through this uh, uh, vagus nerve uh, challenging. So I'd like to leave you with this idea that <clears throat> for many years, brain has been worked, uh, have been studied as a brain organ level. We are moving into the embodied brain. That's amazing to see uh, how much uh, 
brain functions depend not on the brain but outside of the brain, but also we should now bring this notion of holobiont into the brain uh, uh, activity. And I would was not surprised, and you should not be surprised uh, that there is such a tight link when you see uh, the morphology. They are, they are really, really similar. And this is why I'd like to leave you with this Descartes uh, quote, uh, which I've been twisting a little bit. I'm a Olobion, so I am. Thank you very much for your attention. Right, I forget to have the lights up, and uh, we'll take some questions from the audience. I'll, I'll, st I'll start with one. The effect of uh, muramal peptides on NOD2 activation, decreasing satiety, or increasing satiety, decreasing food intake, is that cyclical? Uh, and the reason I ask is that, so this, is it sort of timed with a meal, um, or is it sort of a constant uh, effect? And the reason I ask is, uh, the notion that circadian rhythm is actually changing the microbiota and has a cyclical effect on, on, on food intake. Yeah, you're absolutely right. There are maybe some <coughs> uh, parameters that make uh, specific this action of neuropeptides on the brain by challenging uh, uh, the permeability, the gut permeability uh, with rhythms. Uh, maybe this neuropeptide acting in the brain have something to do with sickness behavior. Uh, I, I try to skip my uh, lecture because otherwise uh, we need another hour and I don't think people will be happy. Uh, but social behavior was impaired. Uh, and so uh, a lot of things to go on uh, with social behavior and, and not to. Um, uh, Something I skip as well, the body temperature control also depend on NO2. Um, so we have right tools now to dig into uh, different parts of the brain. Because what was surprising for us was not only to see NO2 express in, in single neurons, uh, and the, after all, this was shown already in Drosophila and, 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 and other uh, have shown that, but seen in so many parts of the brain uh, involved with very precise functions. I, I just mentioned addictions, social behavior, uh, vital functions like body temperature, social interactions, um, food consumption. So um, I think there is a code now to understand uh, if this is with quantity, with time integration of not two into the brain in order to trigger specific behavior. Not everything at the same time, but we need to understand the code in which precise uh, quantity of NOT2 would trigger behavior A, and, and increasing the quantity O, long-lasting, will have a, 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 a actions B or and not anymore A. So I think this is now really puzzling and interesting to, to go into this kind of idea of specific behavior. Great, thank you. Uh, questions? Here. Is there uh, some possibility to measure <coughs> uh, and to uh, analyze the response to uh, bacterial glycopeptides? Some time ago, it was described that humans suffering from multiple sclerosis have these bacterial components in their brains opposite on uh, its controls. I would like to ask if you had opportunity uh, to have a look on uh, some models of human diseases in your system. Well, uh, regarding um, um, human diseases, we are working on Parkinson right now since uh, two years, uh, but on uh, microbiota, not from the gut, but from the nasal microbiota. And, and we found a specificity of uh, changes of the nasal microbiota and um, uh, neurogenerative uh, actions in, in the brain. I, I can't say more today, but uh, uh, it was really puzzling for, me, for us. We've been working uh, with different uh, Parkinson patients in, in France and uh, in different parts of the place of the world. And, with different food, with different uh, 
uh, climate and, uh, and, and we found uh, changes in the microbiota which uh, accompanying uh, changes in the symptoms of the disease. Um, but this is uh, only one, uh, one side and uh, many other people have been uh, showing also uh, uh, microbiota involved in uh, some neurodegenerative disease like Alzheimer's and MLS as you, you mentioned. Great, we have a question over here. So just uh, very two quick questions. I'm beautiful lecture, thank you. Uh, I'm very much surprised by the uh, decrease in the activity in the NTS. I mean, the, the old age microbiota is considered to be dysbiotic, more pro-inflammatory, so I would, on the contrary, expect higher activity in the sensing area. So is it a compensatory inhibition? Uh, you're right that uh, uh, in this uh, data I show you, I didn't show you what kind of neurons. <laughs> because I if, if the green, uh, the activating neurons will be inhibitory neurons at the end, uh, it, it's going to be an inhibition of the activity. So, so we have been able to show that uh, with CFOS that there was uh, uh, activity that we could uh, decrease for the spontaneous, but we don't know yet what kind of neurons are sensitive to these actions. Okay, and then with respect to the feeding behavior in the RQ8 nucleus, what was the proportion of neurons which actually responded to neuropeptides and were also other, uh, I mean, neurons in other areas apart from the RQ8 nucleus uh, activated or sensing these uh, neuropeptides? Um, so, I didn't do the experiment, but what I heard from uh, Antoine, who, who was doing the slice physiology, was a, a bit upset with me because he had only one, uh, one um, neuron sensitive out of three, uh, responding to MDP uh, diffusion through the pipette. So, so of course, I mean, lack of responses uh, doesn't mean um, the recording neurons do not express uh, uh, not two, Maybe we had problems of diffusion of MDP. Maybe uh, uh, the conditions were not, so we, we don't know, but the, the, the response is one third of accurate, ne accurate, uh, accurate neurons, uh, 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 epidemic neurons from the accurate uh, nucleus are responding to uh, MDP in the pipette. Uh, whether we have other neurons sensitive to uh, to, to uh, MDP, uh, we haven't tried to patch, but from what I show you and the C4 staining, obviously many neurons were uh, uh, responding to, um, uh, to uh, MDP uh, by C4, uh, and we had uh, inhibitory interneurons, like uh, I should have said that actually in the hypothalamic neurons, the, the, the ones that are responding are inhibitory interneurons, but we have also, uh, in, like in the cortex, insula uh, cortex, for instance, have uh, uh, pyramidal uh, neurons uh, responding to NOD2. So either excitatory, both inhibitory are responding to NOD. So uh, a lot of works to do. Okay, we have one. Hey, okay, thank you very much, uh, Pierre Deschelot. Uh, a comment and a question. The comment is that these data with neuramyl D-peptide confirm that bacterial compounds can influence food intake. And it's, it's, it's also reassuring for us mm -hmm. since we published some years ago about the CLPB protein as reinforcing the satiety pathway. But until now, we're missing something increasing appetite, <laughs> so that's fine. And the second comment is about the sex difference because yes. we have repeatedly shown in other groups also that the microbiota at the basal level is different uh, between females and males in mice and the response to stress models is also different. For instance, the anorexia-based activity model, uh, activity-based anorexia model, uh, we have really striking differences between males and females. So I think it makes sense with all this. My question is about to, pr to prolong the previous one about the type of neurons, because you have shown activation in the arcuate, but also in the lateral hypothalamus. And we know that in arcuate, we have both orexigenic and PYAGRP producing neurons, as well as POMC neurons. And in the lateral hypothalamus, we are rather satiating pathways. And in your paper, you discussed about GABA, 
some GABA producing neurons, but I don't remember each, which region you identified the GABA producing neurons that were activated by the MDP. So could you comment about the specific, again, about the specific types of neurons right. that might be activated by not two yeah, stimulation? Yeah, yeah. So it's, it, they, they were GABA as much as we could see, for instance, with uh, patch clamp recordings, and then we did PCR analysis to look uh, the signature, and, and for those who were responding one third, they were all GABA. Um, uh, and that's the reason why also uh, we tried to do this uh, uh, knockdown with the uh, adenoviruses to remove only NOT2 in the arcuate and not other, plus or, or other part of the, of the, of the brain. Uh, really, a really nice presentation. I, I just had a question. How do you put the, uh, the other satiating hormones into your model? I mean, this is, this not signaling, not too signaling, is certainly not the only one. Um, have you looked at interactions like with GLP-1 or, um, you know, which has received a lot of attention recently that would also greatly affect uh, food intake or desire for food intake? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to be disappointed uh, because I have no idea, no clue. Uh, uh, we've been very uh, focusing on, on the hypothalamus uh, responding to, to uh, MDP, um, but uh, there are probably other cascades uh, that take the job. Um, also regarding uh, this uh, gender issue, uh, uh, microbiota could be uh, changing, but there are also dimorphisms in the hypothalamus, and so uh, through the relay of other satiety factors, uh, probably th this is much more complicated than I, I, I show you. I, I really apologize. This was uh, uh, already five years uh, with a huge team to work, uh, but I realize from your questions that we are far from having a clear picture of what's going on. Okay. We'll take one more question. Thanks a lot. Um, I have a, a question on this relationship between food intake you showed and thermoregulation. You, you alluded to that. And so I guess my, my question is, is about thermoneutrality. Do you think that your results could change if you put the, the mice at thermoneutrality, uh, especially also regarding the control of food intake and, and the phenotype you, you showed? Yes, uh, we haven't been doing those experiments you mentioning, uh, and obviously um, we're not going to do it because the postdoc is gone, and uh, and I didn't find uh, uh, people to work on on this issue. Um, but I think this is really for a master. I think a kind of short-term project, challenging temperature, room temperature, and see what's going on. Uh, so thank you for inspiring me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, we will do that. Thank you. <laughs> Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. We'll move on to our next speaker. <laughs> All right. Our next speaker is uh, Karine Clement, and she's from the Sorbonne University in Paris. Her research unit in INSERM works on the pathophysiology of obesity and related disorders, particularly focusing on inter-organ crosstalk. And she's gonna be speaking on microbial biotin and obesity. Yeah. Thanks a lot. <coughs> so hi everyone. So I want to thank again the uh, organizer for this uh, really, in really interesting meeting in this, I mean, great city, uh, Prague. And so um, I, I, I'm going to speak of you know, uh, um, maybe something we, we haven't really uh, speak about, which is vi vitamin in the context of metabolic disease. So I, I think there's no need to <laughs> come back on the multifunction of the gut uh, uh, mic microbiota, and, and uh, basically my talk will echo many of the talks uh, um, we had uh, during these two days. And uh, well, of course, as you know, gut microbiome is key in the, in the um, development of, uh, of um, our intestine. We, we spoke about the, the, the key aspect regarding carbohydrate and the, the digestion of food. Maybe something I, I will come back uh, in, in a minute uh, of, uh, is, is also the metabolism of uh, uh, 
some uh, compound and especially uh, medication, uh, and I will, I will come back on that. Of course, uh, immune system development, and, and I will uh, focus, as, as I just said, on vitamin sy synthesis. And indeed, wh when we, we, we think about um, gut microbiome and what's in the textbook, it's always written that uh, of the, the gut microbiota is involved in the synthesis of K, K vitamin and, and also B vitamin, but we, we always think about uh, B12. And to some extent, vitamin synthesis is, is a bit neglected uh, in, in, in this field. So, uh, as Dr. Wood mentioned, so my group is working for, for many years now in, 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 in obesity and in the complex pathophysiology of obesity. And, and, and we, we've been studied people with overweight, moderate obesity or severe obesity. And, and among severe obesity, and, and you all know that this pathology is increasing also uh, worldwide, we, we've been uh, looking at uh, gut microbiome uh, change in composition, uh, diversity and richness. And what you, you get on, on, on the, the panel on, on, on the, well, it's your left. <laughs> um, you, you, you see that if you take a, a threshold for diversity, and, and if you, you look at microbiome richness in, in a, a, a population candidate for bariatric surgery, uh, you will see that about 75 of these uh, uh, subjects will fall in, in a low diversity group. So low bacterial richness is very important in, in this category of population with, with a, a severe, and, and, and I don't like this term, but we, we see also morbid form of obesity. And then you can, in, in these people, you, 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 we have uh, uh, several, uh, uh, for obesity management, we have several tools, and among those tools, we, we have bariatric surgery. So you, you can either restrict food by, for, for example, uh, putting this uh, uh, gastric ring you, ca you can see in the yellow um, box, or uh, using the, the, the model of gastric bypass. And some years ago already, we, we look at, at the kinetic of, uh, of the change in, in gut microbiome richness for, uh, uh, prospectively and, and, and looking at uh, what's going on after bariatric surgery. And what you can, you can see is that first we retrieve what we, we've seen before, looking at people with severe obesity, you have individuals with low uh, microbiome richness, but for others, it's not really an issue. And, and then if you follow this, this um, subject with time, and even after five years, to some extent, some people will, will recover uh, a change in gut microbiome richness. And as you may know, uh, this is a marker, and this is also associated with change in the gut microbiota composition. And, and, and we had long-term or mid-term follow-up after bariatric surgery, in that case bypass, where we, we, they tend to recover uh, from, from richness. Another uh, phenotype uh, we, we've heard uh, about, not, not, not a lot in, in, in this meeting here, but in previous meeting, is about enterotype. And we, we were able in the different uh, population also uh, to build on terotype and, and, and th there is, a, uh, you know, this constellation of bacteria, uh, either you have enrichment in Rominococcus prevotella or Bacteroides. And, and what you see on the panel is, is with the progression of obesity, so the worsening of body mass index, you have also a, a, a increased prevalence of people with this so-called Bacteroides B2 phenotype, which is uh, when you look at association study, basically associated with increased uh, low-grade inflammation and, and measured here only by CRP, but we've done that on, on immune cells or, or, or other uh, cytokines. So I guess the message here is that there, there is major dysbiosis in patients with severe obesity, and, and, and we have some degree of rescue after bariatric surgery. So, um, and when I, we say dysbiosis, I, I will try to show you that uh, dysbiosis actually is extends to altered B vitamin um, uh, metabolism. And uh, as you know, or, or don't know, uh, uh, there are several types, uh, a lot of types of, of vitamin, and, and they have key function in, in our um, biology. And they are especially also involved in, in, in glucose, lipid metabolism, and, and, and many uh, of, of our function in our organs and overall in our body. And I'm going to speak about vitamin uh, B7 or 8, depending on countries, called biotin. And again, if you think of biotin, you will think immediately about the health of 
uh, your, your skin, uh, your nails, your hair, but you don't really think about uh, biotin as a key factor for metabolic function, such as uh, uh, amino acid or carbohydrate uh, uh, metabolism. And uh, uh, actually, wh what has been uh, uh, reviewed, and, and we did a review some, uh, last year about that, is that if you specifically uh, look at people with severe obesity, again, this is a thing which is neglected, uh, uh, the, the, the frequency of vitamin a deficiency as a whole is, is, is very high. So for example, in our population of, of people with severe obesity going for the bariatric surgery path, you will have about 70 to, to 80 percent of the population with uh, vitamin B deficiency. Uh, they, they don't re reach the level of the recommendation. And so the, the, the source, of course, are, are we, as humans, we are unable to synthesize these vitamins. So as a source, of uh, uh, vitamin, we, we, it, it's coming from food, and uh, uh, also so it, it's, it, it's going into, uh, of course, the gut, but the gut microbiota also is able to either transport the, the, the vitamin, the B vitamin or biotin, or even synthesize the, the, the biotin. And, and as I just said, there are many uh, functions related to uh, immunity, uh, uh, metabolism, and so on. And for example, just for biotin, it has been shown that this vitamin is, is, is actually involved in the regulation of at least 2,000 genes, uh, human genes. Okay, so how do we uh, fall into this world of, uh, of B vitamin and, and especially uh, biotin here? So this started by, by um, uh, the work done by this uh, huge consortium called uh, Metacardis for Metagenomics in Cardiometabolic Disease. And uh, so this, is, this was a European-funded project, and the idea was to uh, look at the impact of qualitative and quantitative change in the gut microbiota on the pathogenesis of cardiometabolic disorders uh, uh, and related comorbidities. So uh, as you can see on, on, on this slide, so we were 15 partners, six European countries, uh, uh, as well as uh, many uh, uh, colleagues uh, involved in, in, of course, microbiology, immunology, uh, metabolism, and nutrition, and, and uh, as you know, actually, to, to, to also analyze all this uh, data that were collected, of course, we have bioinformatician experts. So what we have done was to establish a, a, a European cohort of, of more than 2,100 subjects, and there were at, at several groups at different, uh, at different uh, level of severity for cardiometabolic disease. So we had healthy subjects, subjects with obesity, type 2 diabetes, and subjects with cardiovascular uh, uh, disease. And, and so you have the, the, the pipeline here. So the first pillar was about uh, the constitution of these uh, new cohorts, and, and we also work on existing met metagenomics data. Uh, then we, we had uh, uh, really detailed uh, phenotyping exploration uh, from uh, uh, evaluating uh, lifestyle factors, of course, for food, food frequency questionnaires. We had, we had also a 24 hours recall. Uh, we, we had this uh, core phenotyping of with more than uh, 600 uh, uh, biological phenotype, and of course, this molecular uh, phenotype. So everything were going into the data hub, and, and, and we start doing some, uh, some uh, uh, association uh, uh, studies here. So um, two things. First, what, what was kind of obvious in this uh, cohort, and especially in patients with metabolic uh, alteration, is the fact that uh, we, we have to deal with polypharmacy. And uh, uh, we, 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 we knew already, for example, that the uh, first line of treatment for type 2 diabetes is metformin. Of course, we, we have signature for metformin. Statin is, is also uh, very important, and, and we showed, for example, that statin is also associated with the lower prevalence of gut microbiota dysbiosis. Basically, in our population, those patients taking statins had, had, had a better um, uh, gut microbiota profile than those not taking a statin here. But, but this extends to many other drugs. So why I am telling you that, it, it's important for, for the follow-up of the talk, it's because when you do this type of, um, of, of, of analysis, then you will need to take into account uh, this uh, polypharmacy aspect uh, in, in the analysis, because many of the signals you can see basically can be due to um, uh, the fact that patients are taking treatment. 
so, and, and based on that, uh, in the last year paper from, uh, from Montan et Al, wh what was shown in this population is that, indeed, taking into account uh, this polypharmacy aspect, we have signature in the microbiome and in the metabolome uh, associated with the cardiometabolic disease spectrum. And I guess the main message of this paper is the fact that uh, these uh, markers can be seen very early, and especially in, in the me metabolic syndrome uh, uh, group, uh, and, 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 and to some extent, the signal disappears in patients with uh, actually advanced cardiovascular uh, disease. Then we, have, we had some work uh, uh, together with Frederick Backhead on one of the uh, metabolites, uh, imidazole propionate, that is basically associated with uh, type pre-diabetes and type 2 diabetes. And then, uh, and, and this is uh, the story I'm going to tell you about, then we had uh, also this data on the gut microbiome biotin metabolism and the relationship with the status. So how uh, does this uh, uh, appear in, in the analysis? So we, we had the opportunity in this uh, um, population to uh, basically uh, look at, uh, especially in severe, uh, in group with severe obesity, and to stratify the population in people being metabolically healthy, metabolically unhealthy. And because metformin <laughs> and, and medication is so important, we, we, we also stratify depending on, on people with type 2 diabetes with or without metformin. And we, we, we not only look at the gut microbiome uh, composition, but also the potential, the functional potential of, of the gut microbiome. And, and this is what, what you get here. And in, in the, in the uh, rectangle, the red rectang rectangle, we, we, uh, when we did this analysis, we observed that some function related to cofactors and vitamin uh, biosynthesis basically came up. Came up. And, and just, uh, I, I won't detail too much about the analysis, what, what you can see here by being uh, uh, RMP, which is relative metagenomic profile, is that we, we also kind of um, adjusted, adjusted our analysis on the amount of bacterial cells which was measured in the uh, stool samples from, from, from the patient. So then from that, okay, we, we could conclude, well, we have several microbiome modules of B vitamin biosynthesis including biotin in that case, altern in severe obesity. So I'm going to speak about biotin, but please keep in mind that all the, the analysis we did, we, we, we've done was repeated, especially at the metagenomic level, were repeated for the other B vitamins. Okay, so biotin and gut microbiota. And, and, and there was only a, a few articles on, on that. This is an example here where, as I told you, <laughs> biotin is, is, when we speak of biotin, we, we think about hair and, and uh, alopecia in that case, where in this uh, work here, it was shown that intestinal dysbiosis and biotin deprivation in that case induce alopecia through overgrowth of lactobacillus murinus in, in, in mice. Okay, so, and, and, and you have an example here on the biotin uh, uh, cycle, with, which basically uh, involves many, many enzymes to, to get the, the, the biotin utilized and synthesized. Okay, so utilized and synthesized. And, and you have on the, on, on the slides the, the picture of Eugenie uh, Belda, who is really expert in uh, metagenomic analysis. And so uh, what, what Eugenie has done was to uh, kind of take the metagenomic data and, and look at uh, carefully in the pathway leading to biosynthesis of biotin uh, or uh, um, bacteria involved in the transport of, of biotin. So there is a simple way to look at it. So you can say, well, there are producers, eventually strict producers, for example, bacteroides, proteobacteria, schizobacteria, or transporters. And then, but if you look carefully, it's not uh, black and white. There are also, uh, as I said, strict pro producers and transporters, and to some extent, bacteria that can do both, transport and biosynthesis. So then we come back, we came back in our data and look at biotin transport and in, in synthesis, and this is a, a, a summary here. And what we observe is that each time in the more severe form uh, of uh, obesity, either severe obesity, or uh, in metabolically unhealthy subject of subject with type 2 diabetes treated by, by metformin, we had alteration of bacterial biotin metabolism, act actually potential, because it's based on, on, of course, looking at the, uh, at the genes. 
So, of course, because we had tons of uh, uh, bioclinical uh, data, so we, we look at the association between bacterial uh, biotin metabolism and host metabolism and inflammation. And what you get here, each line represents uh, either pure, I mean, uh, uh, transporters or, or bacteria that are uh, able to synthesize or mixed. So, th so then you can look in the, the first uh, one, two, three, four, five lines where uh, you, you look at the association with metabolic factors. So what you can see mostly is that in this heat map, you have, you have lo lots of uh, red. So basically, we had negative association between the uh, biotin metabolism potential and a series of uh, uh, bio, um, uh, clinical and metabolic uh, factors. But what you can see eventually also is that there was not so clear association with um, the, 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 the food a, a, as a whole. So we had relationship between uh, bacterial uh, biotin metabolism potential and metabolic factors. So then the question is, what about the host? So, and especially in severe obesity. And, and then when you look at the literature, the, the severe biotin deficiency is very rare. So, so basically this can be associated with a modification in the skin, a, a problem with a, a immunity, altered lipid metabolism, and so on. So, but we, we nevertheless measured a systemic biotin in severe obesity. And, and first of all, because we had access to food frequency questionnaires, what you can see here is, is that if you look the source for biotin in the food, coming from either cereal, fish, salmon, nuts, all seal, and so on, the amount of biotin was the, the same in the different uh, patient groups. But when we measured biotin in the blood in those patients, what you can see is that there is increased proportion of person with uh, um, biotin deficiency or at least a suboptimal level of biotin in people with severe obesity. And another way to, to look at uh, potential biotin deficiency in the host is to look at the adipose tissue. Why? Because biotin is a cofactor for a series of carboxylase which, has, which are absolutely key for adipose tissue metabolism. And, and this was shown some years ago already by a colleague in, in Finland who, who showed that actually in the context of obesity, you have modification uh, uh, at least at the gene expression level of these different carboxylase. So, and we came back in our uh, microarray uh, database in that case, and we kind of confirmed that indeed, in the context of uh, severe obesity, we, you have decreased expression of carboxylase genes. Can we, wh what's going on? So I told you about um, bariatric surgery, which is a condition which is associated with improvement of metabolic condition. So then we, we, we look back in this uh, population, and we observe that indeed, in, in, in following um, patients with bariatric surgery, we had increased um, uh, bacteria able to produce uh, biotin. You can see in red, and this is especially true in the uh, bypass uh, uh, um, condition. Again, looking at serum, you had, we, we observe in this uh, situation where you have improved uh, metabolism and improved inflammation, you have increased biotin level. What about the adipose tissue? It's uh, uh, the, the panel in, with, with green. You, you had increased expression of this uh, biotin dependent uh, carbo carboxylase. Okay, so that's just observational. So we have this hypothesis of default of biotin biosynthesis of transport in the gut microbiota. And we, saw, we showed some effect in the host with a, a diminution of, of uh, uh, biotin level in severe obesity and to some rescue after bypass. Okay, so, but what is the origin of biotin deficiency in severe obesity? And can we modulate biotin metabolism in people in, in, in severe obesity? So first of all, very simple experiment. You, you, we, look, let's look at the role of the diet and weight modification. And, and of course, we had to combine, to come back to, to, to mice here, where uh, what you, you can see here, if you look at the high-fat diet, simple experiment, but we repeated it at least three, four times, uh, uh, despite the fact that these animals in the diet eat more biotin, you have di diminished biotin levels in the, in the blood of, the, of these animals. So decreased plasma biotin under high fat diet. What about gastric surgery in mice? So let's see wh whether we could uh, see, uh, see again an effect, but in that case in, is in mice. Same, animals fed uh, uh, after three months by show diet 
uh, you, you can see increase uh, biotin uh, uh, circulating levels. And if you look on the, uh, the panel on your right, uh, uh, you, you can see also the increase potential of producer, biotin producer by the gut microbiota. So something is happening in parallel in the host and uh, uh, basically in the uh, microbiome. So yeah, but okay, we measured uh, biotin in the host, in the gut microbiome, so, but what is, is it coming? Is there a, a relationship? So then we, we assess to uh, germ-free mi mice, thanks to this collaboration with Frederick Backhead within the Metacardis Consortium. And what you can see, so Frederick basically and his team tested uh, two germ-free models, and you can see in germ-free, diminish uh, systemic biotin. What about antibiotic, uh, antibiotic therapy? Yes. Uh, uh, in that case, you have um, also, when you treat the animals, decrease uh, systemic biotin. So then we could conclude from that, that part of circulating levels of biotin originates from the gut microbiota. So what about gut microbiota transfer in that case? So then we, we, we took uh, fecal material from people with uh, severe obesity and people without obesity and did a gut microbiota transfer in mice. And again, what you can see here, you, you have serum uh, biotin, especially under show diet, you have diminution uh, of uh, serum biotin in animals which receive uh, fecal material from people with severe obesity. And what you can see on the Western diet, basically there is an influence of the diet because uh, the, the, the biotin is still uh, lower uh, in that uh, case in the animal which receive uh, the stool material from uh, people uh, I being either uh, without obesity or, or with, with obesity. So we can say, well, diet has an impact on biotin plasma levels. For show diet, we had a decrease uh, um, for in mice receiving uh, stools from people with severe obesity. And uh, 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 what, what, what we showed is, is, is really, there is really a mixed diet and uh, the, the obesity uh, condition. Okay, so what do we know now about biotin in metabolism? And, and at the time of we did this, this experiment, uh, there was a, a few data in the literature, especially in mice under show diet. And, and what you can see here, there are data, again, showing that either you can look at deficiency of biotin, and this has an impact in animal metabolism, for example, increasing blood glucose or uh, worsening the inflammation uh, status. Or, on the contrary, you can look at supplementation, again, under show diet, where, uh, in, in that case, you, you can see here uh, some data looking at uh, uh, low-grade inflammation, IL-6, TNF-alpha, or, or uh, IL-1B uh, here, where uh, you, you have the, the, the administration of biotin in the diet uh, uh, lead to some uh, um, amelioration, both at the low-grade inflammation level, but also on glucose metabolism. So then we said, okay, so let's try to supplement then animals with uh, installed obesity with two things. First, fibers, and, and why fibers? Because I told you in the case of severe obesity, we have this profound uh, dysbiosis with low richness and altered composition. So we were thinking that uh, giving fibers will help, but also with uh, biotin supplementation. And this is where um, the, the, the COVID period was just great for us because we, 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 the only strain we were able to keep in the, in the lab, we, 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 they had a, we, we called them the lockdown mice because uh, so, so we left them uh, for uh, 12 weeks. And after 12 weeks, when, when we come, came back in the lab, of course, they were not alone. Huh? People uh, fed them and so on. Uh, they were quite, uh, quite obese, right? So, so it's, it's really uh, installed obesity. So uh, then we, we either pursue the IFAD diet or gave IFAD diet plus FOS, IFAD diet plus biotin, or the combination of both. So what happened is that the animals uh, uh, receiving, the, the, as you can see in the red uh, part, um, both IFAD diet, FOS, and biotin just sub stabilize their weight improve their fasting glucose, and diminish uh, markers of insulin resistance measured here by uh, the OMA-IR. So, okay, su uh, simultaneous supplementation of FOS plus biotin in diet-induced installed obesity mimic fat mass in, in those uh, animals. And uh, 
and we, we have some uh, more detailed data on, on body composition and so on. But what about the gut microbiota? And, and we were, we, we, we've, we've seen that uh, uh, looking at Shannon or, or Simpson Index, you can see here, you, you have increased uh, 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 diversity in that case, but look at the yellow one. I mean, that's biotin alone. So, so there is also increased uh, uh, diversity uh, potential, at least in, uh, in those uh, animals, as well as increased potential to uh, uh, synthesize um, biotin by the gut microbiota, especially when we combine FOS and uh, biotin. What about the adipose tissue? I, I told you about the carboxylase and, and what you can see here, especially in red, that we had some degree of amelioration, uh, increased expression of this um, uh, basically uh, carboxylase expressed in the, in the adipose tissue. Okay, so now what's next? Um, again, uh, th there, there are some data uh, some years ago already about the, the use of uh, biotin supplementation uh, in human, and especially fo focusing on, 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 on type 2 diabetes. Why? Because it was shown that biotin is able to promote insulin release uh, uh, and increase insulin sensitivity. So, so now we try to translate uh, this data in human, and especially people with, with severe obesity, where uh, we should try a start a trial uh, uh, really soon. We, we got the IRB um, authorization to uh, supplement people combining fibers plus biotin, uh, biotin plus minus uh, fibers, and, and we see what's going on, es especially for the, the, the potential of the gut microbiome to be able to uh, kind of uh, ameliorate uh, uh, vitamin B as a whole uh, metabolism in the, in, in the gut. And I'm going to stop uh, here. So I showed you uh, the importance of some uh, B vitamin uh, metabolism, especially in the context of severe diabetes. So it's altered in severe obesity, partially rescued after bariatric surgery. We did some work in mice and showing that indeed at least a part of this B vitamin uh, is coming from the gut microbiota. And uh, yeah, I'll show you several types of experiments. And, and just I wanted to emphasize on the importance of vitamin status, uh, especially uh, in people with severe obesity. And our, one of our hypotheses is that when you have a huge increase in fat mass, you might need to uh, uh, basically have an optimization of, what, uh, of vitamins because just the tissues need this kind of focal factors. And one of the issues in, the, in this field and in the nutrition field is that the recommendation for level of, of vitamin just then doesn't take into account weight, people's weight. You have overall uh, recommendation for, for the overall population, but not uh, taking into account uh, uh, subject's uh, corpulence. Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop here. And of course, thanks my, my group, especially Lise Volant, uh, who did um, uh, most of the uh, mouse experiment you, 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 you've seen. Eugenie Belda, I mentioned uh, already, was absolutely key in doing the uh, metagenomic uh, uh, analysis. Of course, long-term collaboration with uh, uh, colleagues at uh, INRA, I should have wrote uh, INRAE, sorry, uh, Joel, and, uh, 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 and uh, all the metacardis uh, uh, teams uh, who have done a tremendous uh, work uh, here. Thank you. Okay, we can uh, take a couple of questions from the audience. Thanks for a, thanks for a great talk. Thank you. Um, you measured biotin in serum of mice. Have you measured also in the luminal context? Because the, the no. one in serum could be coming from diet and you may not know whether it's from bacteria or diet. And so that's, this could be a confounding factor. No, you, you, you're right. I, I use the, the one who reviewed our paper in uh, gut. No, <laughs> we had this question. No. no, no, you're right. We should. So there's two things we are, we, w which are missing here is, is the fact that first, we, 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 it would be very important also to look at uh, metatranscriptomic, uh, I mean, to, to really get, because we, we have the data from uh, sequencing metagenomics. But yes, we, we, we should probably uh, uh, measure biotin in the luminal content. We haven't done that. So it was done. Uh, uh, mostly in, in, in serum, but that was part of the discussion we, we had with this uh, thesis we had to finish 
and and uh, but you you're right we, we, we will do we will do that and actually just I, I, I showed in your talk you mentioned the importance of fibers on a B vitamin uh, uh, metabolism and, and I guess that's probably something very important uh, to, to to explore the, the potential for synthesis of these uh, vitamins yeah yeah exactly I'm happy to yeah. see the results because they go li in line with the high fat diet exactly so, yeah. yeah other questions Hi, Karin, really nice presentation, I really enjoy. I have two questions. So the first one is um, you have observed that biotin supplementation is kind of reducing the colitis development in a DSS treated mouse model. And I was wondering if you had a look also how biotin is affecting uh, intestinal inflammation, if it's able to modulate immune cells or specific immune markers in the gut. And the second question is like, uh, you have shown that in the fecal microbiota transplantation that you have done with Frederick Beckett, they, they use Western diet, and the previous study used IFAT diet, and this non fat is really one of the main factors able to impact and change the gut microbiota composition. And I was wondering why you switch from a 60% fat versus a 45% diet, like diet switching fat. Thanks. Yeah, it, it's. Uh, f I just. On, I will answer the first after. Ju just for the germ free, it was done in, in two models, and it's really easy. I actually, Frederick uh, w uh, uh, had this model already within the consortium. So and and, and uh, yeah. So and in that case, they were fed by by Western diet. So so, yeah, it's possible that this may interfere it, it, just because it was there and serum was there, and, and and we measured that in the different models. So so. Uh, but yeah, probably uh, it should be important, especially regarding the interaction uh, with, um, with food intake, uh, with, with food consumption, which may be very important. Then to answer to your first point, which is uh, really important, is the fact that, um, first of all, a way to, to look at that, uh, especially inflammation in the, in the gut, we had data from a previous experiment where uh, we, we, we took the opportunity to, to take uh, the jejunum sample from people going for bariatric surgery, and, and, and we published that in Cell Metabolism some years ago, where we show uh, that in the context of severe obesity, we, we have increased accumulation of immune cells, and especially uh, CD8 cells in the epithelium uh, layer. And so we, we took this data and look at the relationship be, be, be with, um, in that case, uh, uh, blood uh, biotin, and, and we had this negative correlation uh, with that. So, but it's only correlation, right? But and there are also data in, in the um, in, in the literature looking at uh, in vitro model, and basically in the context of inflammation, if you, uh, for example, uh, 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 increase inflammation using LPS, for example, you have also diminution of, of biotin absorption, and especially this act on, on a very important transporter, which is uh, SNVT. And, and, and in the context of low-grade inflammation, you have diminished absorption. So this is a piece missing in this work, is, is, is the capacity to, of, of, of uh, in the context of obesity to absorb the vitamin. And as you know, it's, it's in, the, in the upper part of the intestine. Karine, uh, thank you very much. Uh, the lockdown mice were very impressive. And it seems that biotin by itself really stopped the, the, or stabilized the weight gain. So did you have the opportunity to use metabolic cages to try to distinguish between an effect of the changes in the microbiota on food intake, as suggested by the previous speaker, or maybe some thermogenic effect on brown tissue activation or something like that? Yeah, so that's uh, the paper which is uh, now in review, that's uh, the, the continuation of this work, where, so what's happening here it is the fact that you, you have, um, in that case, probably due also to, to FOS, is, is that you have diminished also lipid absorption as a whole, and, and, and we verified that also uh, when you look, we look at uh, some transporter for lipids in, 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 the, in, in the intestine. So, so there is, as a whole, in, in, in the mouse body, there is less lipid. And this has consequence on, on, on tissues. And, and for example, we look at brown adipose tissues, we, we had less um, uh, whitening of the brown adipose tissue uh, when, when we look at, you know, liquid accumulation in, in bat in, in those mice. Regarding um, energy metabolism, 
th there is clear uh, uh, leakage of lipids, uh, as I, I told you, and, and, and since the, 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 the mouse uh, uh, weightless, in, in that case, they, they have actually diminished um, uh, uh, energy expenditure uh, as a whole. So, so we, we, we try to, 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 to put all that together, also looking at uh, adipose tissue, and adipose tissue is, less, is, is healthier in that case, less inflammation and less fibrosis. Great, any other questions? If not, uh, Karen, thank okay. you so much. Thank you. So our final speaker is Marie Lair uh, Michel. Um, she's from INRE in Paris. Her current research focuses um, on innate T cells and their interaction with the gut microbiota and health and various pathologies like inflammatory bowel disease. And she's going to be speaking about short chain fatty acid as modulators of gamma delta T cell function. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers to invite me. Uh, so. Looking to the slides, yeah. Um, so uh, this work is entitled "The Gut Microbiota Derived Short Chain Fatty Acids Regulate R17 uh, Production by Mouse and Human uh, Intestinal Gamma Delta T Cells." So uh, in our lab, we are interested in, uh, in the interaction between microbiota and immune cells. You all know that microbiota uh, can be beneficial or deleterious and the um, environment is pretty important to influence the microbiota. Antibiotics, a diet, or probiotics can influence the microbiota. And so the dialogue between microbiota and immunity um, is important as an impact on immune study. And if there is a disruption of this, uh, this, this uh, equilibrium, we can have um, disease like inflammation. Um, we are especially uh, interested in two cytokines, R17 and IR22. These two cytokines are in the interface between um, protection and inflammation. They are important for tissue protection, uh, tissue repair. Um, they promote epithelial barrier integrity and proliferation, induce production of antimicrobial peptides, uh, defensin like erectra gamma or the multi mycin. They recruit neutrophils in case of, of um, infection, so they support epithelial barrier protection, and they have pro protective role against um, infection, for example, with uh, Strobacter rodentiae. But on the other hand, they can have some deleterious effects. They favor salmonella colonization. Uh, if there is too much R17 or R22, they can have inflammation. And in human, polymorphism uh, in protease 17 associated uh, gene has been associated uh, with IBD. There are several uh, cells that can produce uh, these two cytokines, uh, especially uh, in, uh, in the gut. There is the, the most common, well-known uh, are the alpha beta T cells, so the conventional T cells, but there is also the gamma delta T cells that are unconventional T cells and the ILC, the innate lymphoid cells. The relative proportions uh, in the gut is dependent to the localization, small intestine, cecum, colon, or even uh, the epithelium or the lamina propria. It depends also the, of the age and um, to the infectious. So our aim is to identify uh, common cells that could um, regulate the R17 or R22 producers uh, in order to um, uh, master uh, their implication in uh, homeostasis or pathology. Uh, it's known that the gut microbiota induces uh, intestinal TH17 cells, the conventional one, uh, for example, Candidatus artromitus uh, in mice. But we want to go further and understand more uh, which common cells uh, regulate uh, these cells or which uh, micro microbiota derive the molecules like metabolites. So uh, our strategy was uh, quite simple. We use antibiotics. And as it was expected, uh, when you use antibiotics, you decrease the production of R17 and IL-22 uh, produced by uh, alpha beta T cells, so um, with the uh, orange uh, cells, or in the blue cells, the gamma data cells. This is true for the small intestine and the colon. But what was not expected 
is that in the colon, and especially in the colon or in the cecum, when you use um, uh, antibiotics, you will see that the production of R17 and IL-22 is increased, the, the production especially by gamma delta T cells. So the question was, what are the mechanisms? And it's the subject of the paper of Chris Dupraz. So a few words about gamma delta T cells in gut. Uh, there are innate T cells between innate and adaptative um, immunity. I mean, there are T cells, but with innate functions. They are constitutively present in gut uh, since the initial stages of uh, postnatal life. So they do not need gut microbiota to colonize the gut and they are ready to produce cytokines and antimicrobial peptides. They have beneficial role. They are important for the defense against Listeria, Candida albicans, or against Clostridium difficile, especially in neonatal host. But on the other hand, uh, we know that they, are in, they can increase uh, metabolic syndrome of diet and lucid obesity, and they are also deleterious in colorectal cancer. So, how microbiota regulate the cells. So, as I told you, uh, if you treat the mice with large-spectrum antibiotics, uh, you will increase uh, the proportion of gamma data cells that produce R17. This is true for the percentage, which is, uh, this is uh, true also for the uh, mean fluorescence intensity. That means that uh, there are more cells that produce R17, but the, the cells that produce R17 express more this uh, cytokine. And the absolute number is also increased. Um, we obtained the same result with germ-free mice. Uh, so um, in germ-free mice, the production of IL-17 produced by gamma cells is increased. You see uh, in the middle panel. But if you conventionalize the germ-free mice with the microbiota from uh, normal mice, if you conventionalize germ-free mice, sorry, uh, with the um, conventional mice, then you will restore uh, the production of IL-17 exactly like uh, white type mice. So to understand better uh, which common cells, or which mechanisms can explain this, we use two antibiotics, colistine that targets gram-negative -negati bacteria and vancomycin that um, target gram-positive bacteria. And you see that with the colistine we have no effect. Uh, the production of R17 uh, is maintained at uh, the same level than control mice. While with vancomycin, uh, you increase the production of R17 produced by gamma data cells. This is true also for the absolute number or in the mean fluorescent intensity. Obviously, when we thought about vancomycin, especially in the colon, we thought about the short chain fatty acids that are decreased uh, in, uh, in the context of antibiotics treatment. You can see here, the, with vancomycin or with the large spectrum uh, antibiotics, you decrease the proportion of um, short chain fatty acids or propionate, butyrate, or acetate. And well, you all know that it's um, the result of the fiber fermentation. So um, we uh, check the correlation in our mice uh, between the IL-17 and IL-22 production by gamma data cells and the concentration of short chain fatty acid. And you can see that there is a clearly a negative correlation. So we um, isolate cells from lamina propria, culture the cells with the short chain fatty acid to see uh, by flow cytometry the production of the cytokines. And uh, we obtain a very clear inhibition of R17 and IL-22 production in vitro uh, produced by gamma data cells uh, in presence of short chain fatty acids. So th this was a mix of uh, the free uh, metabolite, but here it's uh, a P for propionate, B butyrate, and A acetate. So all these three uh, short chain fatty acids reduce the production of R17 uh, by gamma data cells. For IL-22, you can see that it's only propionate that gave um, uh, a good results. So the, uh, the previous uh, um, data that I show you was in the second and the colon, but it's true also if you take the, uh, the, the cells from the small intestine or peripheral organs like spleen or peripheral lymph nodes, you still decrease the production of R17 uh, with propionate. 
for what happened in vivo. For in vivo, as I told you, with antibiotics, you increase the production of R17 uh, um, produced by gamma neutral cells. And as you can see in blue, if you add in the bottle, uh, in the drinking bottle, um, propionate, you will decrease this production of R17. It's very specific to propionate because we couldn't um, obtain the same result with butyrate and acetate. In pathology, uh, we choose the um, DSS and you see a colitis model where uh, we know that it has been shown that uh, propionate is uh, good for the recovery uh, phase. That means that uh, the, the mice recover faster if you, uh, gi uh, if you give the, um, the propionate. But we stop here the, uh, the experiment at day nine. Day nine, there's no difference between control mice and uh, mice that receive propionate. But we know that it's the peak of proliferation of production of R17 by gamma neutral cells. And so in this case, we saw um, a decrease of R17 and R32 produced by gamma neutral cells in the mice that received the propionate in comparison to control mice. So now, what are the mechanisms? There's a several uh, mechanisms possible. It can be uh, just a toxicity. Maybe we have a decrease of R17 because propionate um, targets or kills specifically the gamma dead cells. It can depend to oversight because it's, really it's already known that a short chain fatty acid um, increase the proliferation of T-Rex and increase the production of IL-10. So it's, uh, it can be uh, um, a mechanism or it can be a direct effect. So for the survival, it's clear that there is no difference uh, with propionate. We have uh, even a more ex um, a higher expression of BCL2, so an anti-apoptotic uh, genes uh, with propionate. For uh, the IL-10 or TREG, we just took um, a recombinant IL-10 and, uh, and uh, use this uh, with uh, our cells, and you can see we couldn't see an increase of IL-17 in presence of IL-10. And in IL-10 knockout mice, propionate still in decreased the production of IL-17. So it's not linked to TREG or IL-10. So it might be a direct effect. And effectively, if you isolate lamina propria uh, from control mice, sort the cells, sort the, the gamma tetrad cells, and then after culture the cells with short chain fatty acid, you can obtain um, uh, a clear uh, effect of propionate. So as you can see in the control and propionate, you have a decrease of R17. So propionate inhibits directly gamma tetrad cells. Um, the mechanism, of, uh, direct mechanism of propionate uh, is linked to receptor like uh, GPR41 or GPR43. Uh, there are some transporters like MCT1 or SMT1, so we check the expression of these molecules on gamma data or sorted gamma data cells, and, you, and we found GP43 uh, expression, or light uh, expression, and a very clear seen MCT1 expression. In collaboration with uh, Pasteur Institute, with Francois Trotten, we obtained the GPR43 mice. And um, we, we check the effect of propionate. And as you can see that we still have a decrease of R17 in presence of propionate. So propionate inhibits gamma data cells independently to GP43, GPR43, sorry. Uh, we use the GP, GLPG is the, anti, uh, is the antagonist of uh, GP43. And the last one, uh, ARC, is the um, antagonist of the transporter MCT1. And again, if you block the MCT1, you still uh, decrease the production of R17 uh, by, uh, by the propionate. So it seems to be independent to this uh, two receptor or transporter. So our hypothesis is that we have a, um, a passive diffusion of the propionate. It has been shown, uh, for example, for microphage, uh, we can have uh, this, uh, this kind of effect, and the target uh, is directly the HDAC, so the histone disacetylase. Uh, so um, we, um, we use the TCA. TCA is uh, an inhibitor of the HDAC, and you can see that uh, when you block HDAC, 
you have a decrease of R17. And you, if you add the propionate, you don't have an additional uh, inhibition of this R17. So it seems that propionates uh, act on, well, inhibit R17 thanks to HDAC inhibition. What about human gamma delta cells? Well, R17 is widely implicated in human disease. It's very clear, and gamma delta cells can produce um, gamma, uh, R17 uh, in human. Uh, it been, has been shown in the blood of HIV, tuberculosis, uh, psoriasis, but in LC uh, mice, it's quite uh, LC donors, LC humans, sorry. It's uh, challenging to find R17 uh, producing gamma data cells. Nevertheless, um, we have the chance to uh, work with Aristocles. We had access to IBD patients, and we tried to see if in the blood we can have R17 producers. And as you can see, that some patients don't produce R17 at all, but some few patients, uh, we obtain uh, R17 uh, produced by gamma delta. So we worked with this. Uh, patients and we tried the propionate in vitro and as you can see uh, with the propionate or with a mix of trosh and fatty acid you can decrease the production of R17 while the production of interferon gamma which is widely uh, produced uh, by um, uh, gamma data cells in the, in the blood is not alterated by the propionate. So I hope uh, I convince you that in normal microbiota, you have plenty of trosh and fatty acid, especially propionates, that will uh, target HDAC and then reduce the production of R17. And in the other hand, when you have an alterate microbiota, there's few trosh and fatty acid, and then gamma data cells can proliferate and produce plenty of R17. I would like to thank uh, the team of uh, Aris Sokol I especially, uh, and Louise Dupraz, that uh, she did a PhD uh, on this uh, project, uh, and all the team of uh, ARI. Uh, the collaboration is Francois Trotten with the GPR43 uh, knockout mice, and I thank you for your attention. Okay, we can take a couple of questions from the audience. Thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Uh, can we speculate that uh, adherence of bacteria from luminin to the mucosa is not necessary to observe activation of gamma delta? So, so you because you, you showed that propionate and uh, SEF are crucial in the activation of gamma delta cells. They inhibit the, gamma yeah. delta cells, right? Mm -hmm. How can you speculate on the adherence of bacteria from gut lumen to the mucosa for this activation? Yeah, would, well, it's not clear. At least in gentle mice, the cells can produce R17. Well, they are present. Yeah. So, um, but you showed clearly that when you put the conventional microbiota, you change the action response. Yeah. So the main question is to distinguish on the putative role of the adherence from no adherent bacteria, just to check what is direct and what is on direct effect. Yeah, I have no idea. It would be interesting, yeah. Okay, thank you. Hello. Okay, we have another question up front here. While uh, we're passing out the microphone. I what think about I have one here. Thank you, that was very oh. good. I'm over here. Yeah. Um, gamma delta T cells in the gut are very important for antifungal immunity and, and fungi overgrowth in, in mice and in humans with antibiotics. Besides the effect of the repression of short chain fatty acids, have you considered fungi as, as part of, of uh, this? We didn't, but yeah, it can be a very nice idea. Yeah, with antibiotics, if you have less R17, yeah, candida can, uh, can uh, proliferate, yeah. And it's also well, increased in IBD. Sorry? They're also increased in IBD patients. Yeah, yeah, it can be interesting, yeah. But we didn't check, no. Okay, Papa. Yes, uh, qu quite interesting. Uh, as I understand your data, you were concentrating on the lamina propria, gamma, gamma delta yeah. cells. 
did you have a chance to see if the same effect is happening in the intraepithelial uh, T cells? Uh, in, uh, in the epithelial layer, they don't produce R17. It's the NT4 gamma producers. So for gamma data cells, there are different subsets. And the, the ones that produce NT4 gamma are in, uh, in the epithelial uh, layer, and the ones that produce R17 are in the lamina propria. And for the NT4 gamma, uh, the short chain fatty acid doesn't have an effect. It's maintained. Yeah, so, so in, in the lamina propria, gamma delta are a relatively small fraction. Mm -hmm. uh, I believe you said there was no effect on the alpha beta uh, T cells. Is, is that correct? Well, in my hand, in this model, because it's a, it's a very um, short uh, um, simulation with propionate, but it has been shown uh, in for some model where you have a differentiation of TH17 or you know, conventional TH17 cell, then the short chain fatty acid can have an effect. So there is some paper that says, oh, there is an increase. Some paper say there is a decrease of R17, so it's not clear. So it might have an effect, but it's more for the differentiation of these cells. For gamma data, it's different. They are already differentiated, so they are already um, uh, able to produce cytokines in the gut. And the, 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 the thing is that uh, they, are very, they are quick to produce cytokines and also the short chain fatty acids are quick to, to switch off to this production. Okay, but, but if you do in vivo and look at all, all the cell fractions, uh, do you actually impact our 17 uh, or, or not? It was very specific to gamma data cell. And we check also um, the mate cells in human uh, patient, and I couldn't see uh, a decrease of R17 among mate cells. But it would be interesting to see in pathology, in other you know, in infection. Or yeah, that, that's it, what I was thinking. It might be different. What, what is the overall effect? Um, so, yeah. Be, be interesting study. Yeah, well, this is, uh, oh, the R17 gamma data cells are, be, are deleterious for colorectal cancer. So it might be, it might be interesting to follow up this story and to see this propionate can, could inhibit these cells in this case. Great. Any final questions? If not, Marie, thank you so much. Thank you. So I'm going to draw this session to a close, and I want to thank the speakers once again for their fantastic talks. <laughs> and I'll turn it over to Gail and Harry um, to close the, uh, the symposium. So uh, very, very quick word, uh, I want to thank uh, all, the, all the participants uh, to this uh, meeting. I hope you enjoyed it uh, as much uh, as I did myself. I think we had uh, wonderful speakers, uh, very nice discussion. Uh, I hope you liked the format also. Uh, I want to mention uh, that there will be this very nice meeting of the, neuro, uh, of the ESNM, so the Neurogastro meeting, uh, in a few months uh, in uh, Bucharest, Romania. Uh, and uh, I want also to take this uh, opportunity to thank again uh, our uh, supporters from uh, the industry, so Danone, Sanofi, Biocodex, Bromatec, and Allergosan. And finally, I want to, to thank also the, uh, the logistics and particularly uh, Come to the World, uh, who did a, a great job, I think. And with that, I will uh, uh, let Gail uh, conclude. Yes, I, uh, again, my thanks and uh, from myself, uh, from the organizing committee and from the AGA uh, for all of your attention, for your participation in the meeting. I do want to draw your attention once again to next year's uh, meeting, which is planned to be in Washington, D.C. for the weekend of March 23rd to the 24th. We hope that all of you uh, would come and join us there. And thank you very much again.